Hello to you all. I'd like to begin by thanking you for taking this time out of your morning, your afternoon or your evening to listen to this online sermon. Preaching like this over YouTube is a first for me, as I'm sure it is for many. But we're thankful to God that despite the circumstances that we currently find ourselves in, we can still share his word together and we trust that as we do that now, that he will bless us through it. My name is Stuart and I'm one of the Christians that meet at Brunsfield Evangelical Church and it's my privilege to be taking us through Esther chapter 4 tonight. This is the fourth instalment from our 10 part series looking at the book of Esther. If you haven't watched or listened to the previous three sermons looking at chapters 1 to 3, I would encourage you to do that. All three sermons are available on this YouTube channel and in every video description, including this one, there's a link to the Brunsfield Evangelical website and also an email address that you can message if you have any questions about what is said or you just want to get in touch. All of the verses quoted in this sermon will also be in the video description. Let's just begin our time together with prayer. God and Father, we thank you that despite the circumstances that we're in, we can still share your word together. We thank you for the ability to do this online and we just pray that you would bless us now as we turn to your word. We thank you for the story of Esther and we thank you that it's been preserved for us and it's been recorded and that we can uh, learn so much from it. And we just pray that you would speak now uh, through what is said and that we might be blessed um, by this time spent now. We just commit it into your hands, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as we look at chapter 4, we're going to see how God is in full control of all situations. And we're going to look at that under two headings. Number one, God's promises. How we can have full trust that he is a faithful, promise-keeping God. And number two, God's purposes how he has a purpose for those who follow him. As well as thinking about God's promises to the Jewish people and his purpose for Esther, we will also look at God's purposes and promises and how they apply in our own lives. To summarise where we are in the story so far, in chapter 1 we have seen King Azuerus, or Xerxes as he's more commonly known, cast out Queen Vashti for refusing his drunken request to appear before him and all his officials. In chapter 2 we have seen how beautiful young women from throughout the entire Persian Empire were gathered together so that the king may choose a new queen. And that of all the women gathered it was Esther, a Jew, who the king chose to be his new queen. Although up until this point, as advised by her uncle Mordecai, Esther had kept her Jewish identity hidden. Finally, in chapter 3, we have seen how Haman had been promoted by the king to his right-hand man, a position of great power, influence and authority. Haman then uses his new position to persuade the king to issue a genocidal proclamation that on the chosen day, which was only a matter of months away, every Jewish man, woman and child in this massive empire was to be killed and have their possessions plundered. With this in mind, it's little wonder that our chapter tonight starts with an outpouring of grief. Turn with me to chapter 4, verse 1, and we'll continue the story. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province which the edict of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, 
one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told them everything that had happened, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show Esther and explain to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and to plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and all the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman to approach the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law. They be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. If you please keep your Bibles open as we'll be referencing bits of the passage as we go through this together. So here we are at the start of chapter 4 and the situation is desperate for the Jewish people. The writer makes no attempt to disguise the grief that was felt at this moment. Listen to the language that he uses. Verse 1 says, Mordecai cried with a loud and bitter cry. He also tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. Sackcloth is a thick, woven fabric, usually made from goat's hair, that the Israelites would wear as a symbol of deep sorrow. We remember the story of Joseph and how his brothers sold him into slavery and brought back a false report to their father Jacob that his son had been killed by wild animals. When Jacob heard the news, he, like Mordecai does here, tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and mourned for his much-loved son. This is the level of grief that Mordecai is displaying here over the decree that's gone out. It's like a father who has just heard the news that his son has tragically been killed. It's not just him though. Verse 3 tells us that in every province where the decree was read, there were many of the Jews who put on sackcloth, as well as what is described as great mourning, fasting, weeping and wailing. And what of our queen? How is she feeling about it? Well, verse 4 tells us she was deeply distressed. So in verses 1 to 4, we have every Jew, from Queen Esther in the palace, all the way to the men, women and children in the remotest provinces of the empire, all devastated at this announcement. However, Despite this dire situation, hope is not lost. In the rest of our chapter, verses 5 to 17, tells us about this fascinating discussion that Esther has with Mordecai through the eunuch Hatach, who acts as the middleman. Hatach is clearly someone that Esther trusts, as the messages she gives him to pass on to Mordecai reveal her Jewish identity. And if he were to report that at this point, this could have had very serious consequences for the Queen. After Esther's initial instigation in sending Hathach out to her uncle, Mordecai responds in verses 7 to 9. 
He tells Esther the full extent of the horrific decree that Haman has sent out. And he even hands Hathach a physical copy of the decree to give to Esther, to ask her if she will go before the king and plead for the lives of her people. This may seem like a sensible suggestion for Esther to speak to the king about a decree that has condemned her people, as well as being the only man with the power to do anything about it. He was also her husband. Surely this is what we would call a no-brainer. Well, we need to remember here, this was not your average husband and wife relationship. Esther was in a constantly vulnerable position in that if she displeased the king in any way, she could be cast out like Queen Vashti was before her. If she displeased the king enough, he could even have her killed. So as well as the nature of the decree she'd been asked to speak to him about, there are at least three other reasons why Esther is worried about this prospect of going before the king. Number one, as we've seen already in our studies so far in this book, the king has a volatile, impulsive and irrational nature. Number two, he had not asked for her in 30 days, which Esther fears may mean that she is somehow out with the king's favour. And finally, and critically, if anyone goes before the king uninvited, even the queen will be executed, unless the king holds out his golden scepter to her, showing that he is pleased to welcome her into his presence. So these are some of the very genuine and understandable concerns that Esther has, and she expresses these to Mordecai. However, Let's take a look at Mordecai's reply in verse 13 and 14. He first points out that if Esther does nothing, she will not escape the terrible devastation that is soon to come upon all the Jewish people. He then goes on to make two amazing comments that we're going to focus on for most of our remaining time together, as we see how God is in control and we consider his promises and his purposes. Read the first comment with me in verse 14. Mordecai says to Esther, For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come from the Jews from another place. Come for the Jews from another place. What an incredible statement for Mordecai to make. In the face of their annihilation, he confidently predicts that deliverance will come. If not through Esther, then by someone else. He doesn't say deliverance maybe will come, or that deliverance perhaps will come. He says it will come. So where does this statement come from? Has Mordecai just had a rush of optimism? Or in desperation, is he trying to cling on to some faint hope? No, that's not the case. Although God's not mentioned specifically in this chapter, or in the entire book of Esther for that matter, this is one of the clearest references that we can see to God, and specifically in this case, to God's promises to his chosen people, and his faithfulness to keep those promises. Mordecai declares in this verse that he has faith that God will keep the promises that he made to his forefather Abraham. In Genesis 12, God speaks to Abraham and gives him the incredible promise that he will make Abraham's descendants a great people. Then a few chapters later in chapter 17, God promises an everlasting covenant with Abraham and his descendants. So even in the face of total annihilation, Mordecai believed that God would honour his everlasting covenant and would preserve his people. What does that tell us about God? It tells us that he keeps his promises, but that also he is faithful despite the unfaithfulness of his people. The history of the children of Israel is like many of our own personal life experiences, filled with highs and lows in a relationship with God. There are times when the nation followed God and enjoyed that close relationship that God intended to have with them. However, sadly, most of the time they were disobedient 
and they wanted to do things their own way. Previous to the story of Esther, it was because of the people's disobedience that God allowed them to be conquered and he allowed them to be taken away from the promised land which he had given them. Their disobedience was the very reason why many of the Jews now found themselves scattered throughout this Persian Empire. But isn't it wonderful to see that despite the people turning their backs on God, he never turned their back on them. His love and his care for his people remained. And Mordecai here seems to be in the knowledge of this wonderful truth. And he knows that God will not allow this decree to come to pass and for his chosen people to be eliminated. Before we look at what this means for us, we must consider another promise of God to Abraham. And another reason why Mordecai is confident God will not allow this to happen. Back in Genesis 12, after promising to make Abraham's descendants a great people, God goes on to say that through Abraham, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Who does this reference to? Well, it's of course a reference to our Lord Jesus, who God here promises would come through the line of Abraham and who would be a blessing to many through his redemptive work on the cross. Galatians chapter 3 says these words, Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham, saying, All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. This means that despite most of us listening to this not being Jews, through faith we have been brought into God's blessing. This was impossible before Lord Jesus' death and resurrection. However, now we Gentiles have an opportunity to enjoy a relationship with God. When the Lord Jesus instituted the supper in the upper room, he spoke of the cup representing the new covenant in his blood. What this means is that since the Lord's precious blood was shed on the cross, the situation has changed. God has not forgotten his ancient people and he will honour every promise made to them. However, for the last 2,000 years, both Jew and Gentile have been called to believe in the Lord Jesus for salvation. And the gospel goes out that that is the only way that we can be blessed by God, through the Lord Jesus. If you are listening to this and you don't know the Lord Jesus as your saviour, I would lovingly urge you to consider this. The promise-keeping God says this to you. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We hear or say the words, I promise, so often, don't we? It always becomes numb to us we hear it that often. How many times in our daily lives have we seen or experienced broken promises? Probably far too often. However, it's not so with God. He is forever faithful and true to his word and his promises will not be broken. For those of us that are saved and are part of the new covenant in the Lord Jesus' blood, why don't we consider some of the amazing promises that God has made to us? When looking at the promises of God, there's enough to do an entire series of sermons. However, for the next minute or so, let's just listen to a few of them and allow these wonderful truths to refresh and encourage us. These promises of God can all be found in the Gospels of Matthew and John. When the Lord Jesus was here on earth, he said these things. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge them before my Father in heaven. If anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth he will certainly not lose his reward. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. All that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. 
I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What an incredible series of promises. And this is just scratching the surface. There's one more promise I'd like to bring to our attention. This one can be found in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans. For we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For many Christians going through hard times, this can be a promise that people struggle with and even doubt its truth. However, let's keep it in mind as we move on to our second heading, which is God's purposes. Going back to our chapter and to our key verse, verse 14, Let's remind ourselves of the words of Mordecai. He says, For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance to the Jews for the Jews will arrive from another place, but you and your family will perish. And who knows, but you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai here suggests to Esther that perhaps it's no accident that she is queen. He suggests that she may be in this position for the very purpose of going before the king to plead for the lives of her people. Once again, without God being specifically mentioned, he is very clearly being spoken of as the one who is in control and who has planned for this exact moment. King Xerxes, he quite literally could have chosen any girl in his entire kingdom to be his new queen. Now, two and a half thousand years ago, when the story of Esther took place, it's believed that just under half the world population were living under the control of the Persian Empire. This was close to 50 million people. So the chances of Esther being chosen were slim beyond belief. And yet, out of all those millions of people, it's Esther who is chosen. Surely none of us would put that down to chance or to coincidence God had a specific job for Esther to do and he put her in that position so that she might fulfill his purpose for her God provided her not only with the opportunity to fulfill his purpose but he also provided her with the support that she needed it's clear to see in this chapter that without the words of Mordecai particularly in verses 13 and 14 Things could have worked out very differently in our story. Isn't it such a comfort to know that God is in control of our circumstances? Esther here, she might not have understood the reason why God had made her queen until this very moment, when God's purpose for her became clear. And so it is in our lives. We may never be promoted to royalty or to be pleading for the lives of millions of people, However, God does put us in certain places, in certain situations, so that he might bring about his purpose for us. He will also never leave us alone. The Holy Spirit is always within us as a helper. And often, God will put other people in our lives to help, strengthen and encourage us when we need it most. Wouldn't it be helpful, though, if we had someone like Mordecai to point out our opportunities to fulfill God's purpose for us when they come along. In reality, many of our opportunities won't be as obvious as Esther's was here. But imagine the difference it would make in our lives if our mindset was to see the situations we are in and the places that we're put as opportunities from God to live out his purpose for us in whatever way that may be. The world is full of lost people trying to find their purpose doing things like travelling halfway across the world to find themselves. 
In our lifetimes, the concept of our purpose has never been so shaken as it is today. The fragility of our world and our lives has truly been exposed in a way that a few months ago, none of us could ever have imagined. It is right now that many people are coming to realise that the things that define our lives, our careers, our sports teams, our friends, our families, our travelling, our socialising, they can be taken away from us and we can be left with nothing. But isn't it such a wonderful thing that as Christians we can have the peace of mind that we know that our lives will never be without purpose? When things go wrong, we don't need to start scrambling to reclaim our sense of purpose because we know that as long as we are left here, our purpose is to serve God each and every day in whatever way he may direct us. Like Esther in her chapter, all we have to do in our own situations is to decide whether to fulfil his purpose for us or not. These situations that we're put in they might not always be comfortable ones. It could be situations that are awkward, that are difficult, or that are upsetting. We may ask ourselves, why has God allowed this? Or why has God not made things happen the way that I'd planned? Isaiah 55 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. Things may happen in our lives. The lives of those we know and even on a global scale like what we're seeing at the moment with the virus. We don't understand them but we can always trust that God is not only in control but that he has a purpose for us and that he works for the good of those who love him. So as we come to a close let's look back on the final few verses of our chapter. In verse 16, Esther agrees to go before the king on behalf of her people. And she tells Mordecai, if I perish, I perish. You'll have to listen to the next few sermons to find out how she gets on. But she declares here that she's willing to give up her life on behalf of her people. Again, in the book with no direct references to God, is this not a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ? The one who is willing to lay down his life so that we may live and give up his life as a ransom for many. How thankful we should be that for what he has done for us. Without him, none of what we have thought about tonight is possible. But through him, we can take comfort and enjoy the promises of God. Our lives can have true purpose, serving him in whatever way he may lead. And we can have real peace, knowing that in all situations, God is in control. Let's just close in prayer. God and Father, we just want to thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for all that he's done and we thank you that because of him we can claim your promises and that we have purpose and that we have hope. We thank you for him and we thank you also for this time that we've been able to spend together uh, looking at your word in the book of Esther. We just pray that uh, we might all have been blessed by uh, this time that we have spent. And we just pray that you'll be with each and every one of us as we live out our daily lives. Um, and we just pray that we would have the courage to fulfil your purposes for us in our lives. We again just give you all our thanks. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.